Well, hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Ben Trollinger, Editorial Director at Acres USA, the voice of eco agriculture. For those of you who may not be familiar with Acres USA, I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about who we are. We were founded 50 years ago by Charles Walters as an agricultural newspaper that took aim at the economic and environmental abuses of industrial agriculture. And Walters once said that for agriculture to be economical, it must also be ecological. And we still live by those words today in our pursuit of teaching growers how to farm sustainably and regeneratively without resorting to damaging industrial chemicals and excessive tillage. In essence, we're an education company. We produce a monthly magazine, a twice monthly podcast, books, online education courses, and of course, we host events, including Healthy Soil Summit, Advancing Hemp, and the Acres USA Eco Ag Conference. These events draw together some of the leading experts in sustainable agriculture and soil health. For more information on that, you can visit acresusa.com, where we're currently having a massive sale at our online bookstore. Um, again, that's acresusa.com. I also en encourage you to visit events.acresusa.com. We've got a virtual event coming up in May that features some of the leading experts on hemp production and soil health. Okay. Now we're gonna go on to the webinar, which is brought to you by Microbiometer. Today, we're going to learn about how microbes protect plants. And we're joined by Dr. Judith Fitzpatrick, one of the founders of Microbiometer, which is a New York-based company, New York State-based company, that is looking to change the way we think about soil testing. Her talk today is all about how we can lessen our dependence on pesticides and chemical fertilizers by understanding and harnessing the power of biological systems. Dr. Fitzpatrick is a microbiologist and a recognized leader in the development of on-site diagnostic tests. She has over 15 published papers and holds 13 patents. She founded Microbiometer after she realized that existing tests for soil quality were based on chemistry and physical properties and not the critical role that microbes play in soil and plant health. For more information about our company, visit microbiometer.com. Before Judy begins her presentation, I wanna encourage you all to submit questions into the chat. We will have time at the end of the presentation for a Q&A. And without further ado, please welcome Dr. Judith Fitzpatrick. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. And we're going to talk about the plant's immune system. And I'll try to explain in some detail for you actually how the soil microbes protect the plants. Next slide. Okay. The advantages of the plant having a strong immune system, and its immune system is, you know, very reliant on soil microbes. In fact, without them, there is almost no plant immune system and you'll need more pesticides. So the plant and the soil are defended against disease and you'll need less pesticides. The large study uh, published not too year long ago by Nature showed that uh, close to a thousand farms, organic farms in Europe use 97% less of any type of pesticide, not just uh, you know, uh, pe chemical pesticides, but organic pesticides too. And of course that gives a lot less pollution. And studies have shown that one of the biggest reasons people like to buy organic foods is to not be exposed to pesticides. And the nutritional value of organically grown foods greatly exceeds that of non-organically grown foods even though the USDA does not report this because the USDA is looking at a few basic nutrients such as uh, uh, sugars, carbohydrates, proteins, fats, etc. But there are 20,000 immune modulator molecules that occur in organic foods that are exposed to microbes and these not only enhance taste because organic foods are always reported to taste better, but these contain antioxidant and other very important nutri nutrients that protect against disease. Next. Um, 
so the best way we know of right now to increase in, improve your plant and soil health is to increase the number of microbes. And you do that by increasing them and not decreasing them. So when you overuse the chemical fertilizers, NPK, the plant, which usually is giving 30 to 50% even of its photosynthate to the microbes in the soil stops releasing those. And so you do not get the, uh, the number of microbes that you would get. So do not over fertilizer with mineral fertilizers or actually any fertilizer, okay? Now, a lot of times people ask me about adding specific microbes to your soil. And there are papers out there that show that specific microbes can have fabulous results, okay? But you have to be aware that when you do this, that you know it's going to depend on your soil and your climate and your seeds, okay? So you're going to have to do research before you do this because it's not ready for you know supermarket type implementation. So the the the, the, the message here is go for the best microbe food. How do you know it's the best microbe food? If it's the best microbe food, you're gonna see that the number of microbes increases. And you can use some mineral fertilizers, okay? But if you've used the mineral fertilizer too much, you're, what you're going to see is the number of microbes drop. Next. And this is just a little diagram to show you the effect of ex excess nitrogen on the root, okay? On the left here, we have excess ammonia. And what you can see is the root fails to develop. That's because the root it develops when it needs to forage for nitrogen. Here's excess nitrate, okay? And here you are with the nitrate concentration that's normal in the soil, if there's sufficient nitrogen, you see that the plant itself is foraging for the natural nitrogen that's being produced in the soil. And then, you know, you even see a, a good root system here, even at low levels of nitrogen in the soil, the plant will be encouraging the microbes in the soil the rhizobia to multiply and to fixate nitrogen from the air. And then if it's very, very low, the plant goes into survival strategy. Next. So the plant immune system back is like ours. It's gonna protect you against pathogens and it'll do that either specifically recognize an attack or non-specifically recognize an attack. And it heals wounds because this is where pathogens can enter. And it responds to environmental stress, stress, okay? That is, we make cortisol. And we're gonna talk about, we talk about the plant immune system. We're saying these are parts of the plant immune system that are very highly reliant on microbes. Next. So interestingly, our immune system, which looks a lot like the microbes in the soil, is actually in our bone marrow, and so we just take it with us. But th this not so great picture on the right-hand side here shows you the plant immune system, and most of the plant, you know, half of the plant immune system or more is microbial, and it's in the biome, the plant biome, which is the microbes in the air, the microbes that live on the leaves and in the soil and are actually inside the plant itself. Next. So just like us, the plants have two immune systems. On the right hand side is a systemic innate or inborn immunity. And on the left is a systemic or acquired immunity. Just like us, you're not born with immunity to measles, you develop it when you're exposed to measles. And we'll be talking about some specific instances of this. Next. 
Now, there's a big energy cost for keeping defensive resources. And if you're fighting a disease, the energy that it takes is not going into productivity or growth. Okay. So what you want to do is you want to be prepared, but you don't you only want to activate those immune resources when they're needed. Just like, like you know, having a standing army, but not, you know, having it everywhere all the time. Next. Now, this innate immunity. As, as well as the specific immunity, is activated by rhizobacteria, which are recruited from the soil microbial community. So in the middle of this picture here, you see there's a soil microbiome. And what you can see is the number of microbes becomes more numerous as you move towards the uh, root area. And it's most dense actually in the one millimeter it's actually on the root and stuck very tightly to the root. And we have, uh, it's in the air. Of course, the air is also microbes coming from the soil. It's in the phylosphere and the endophytic. These are the microbes that have actually entered the plant, okay? And live within the plant. So they live within the leaves, they live within the stems, uh, they live within the roots. So there's a strong uh, endophytic community for everywhere. And some of their metabolites are actually influence the taste of the foods that we create. Next. Okay, so how do microbes actually uh, increase the alertness of the plant to disease? or to other stimulants, okay? They do it through receptors on their cells. And there's three different type of receptors that are especially important. And they're MAMPs, PAMPs, and BAMPs, okay? MAMPs stands for a microbe associated molecular pattern. So on the surface of every cell, in, this, in the plant, you have a receptor that can bind and recognize that something pr that's present is a microbe. And that's, that's because there are some things that are just common to microbes. And I often, when I try to imagine it, I think to myself, it's like the same way that our brain knows that this is a dog. It doesn't know what kind of dog it is, but it knows it's a dog. And then there are damage associated molecular patterns. So within the plant, just like in our own body, cells, if they're going to die, they actually close up shop and they don't just spill their cytoplasm out into you know, the outside, okay? Everything's packaged up and taken care of. If a bug comes and damages the cells in a leaf, it releases cytoplasm. And they, since these things are not supposed to be exposed, there, there are research re receptors that will recognize them. This is important in terms of the um, protection against insects. And then there are pathogen associated molecular patterns. There are virulence factors and other things and once the plant has been exposed to a pathogen, it can uh, institute a specific or a nonspecific response. Next. Okay. So induced system immunity, that is immunity um, that is put forth, works by non-pathogens up here, uh, reacting with MAMPs. So this is a MAMP. This is a, a, a protein receptor that's in the outside of the cell. Now, the only things that ever enter a cell without being recognized by a receptor, okay, are air and water. Anything that wants to happen, 
all of the communication for a cell occurs at the surface, at the cell surface. So what happens is when the plant is exposed to the microbes in the soil, the microbes it should be exposed to, which is exposed to if there's not excess chemicals around, the number of NAMPs increases. And that actually then is going to um, be, be a, an alternative method for turning on response to pathogens like, hey, there's too many microbes here. Um, how does this work? The cell, the, when the, when the um, receptor here is bound to a bacteria or, or another microbe, like similar microbe, it sends signals into the cell, which turns on DNA, which makes appropriate immune responses. Now, there's not just one kind of NAMP. There's probably thousands on every cell. And, not, and they recognize different things. So this is a very complex system. And it's the same over here. We have pathogens, which will stimulate a receptor for pathogens, and it will turn on an appropriate response for pathogens and for damage. And this is showing it's the same receptor, but it is not the same receptor. So there are different receptors and there's lots and lots of receptors. 50% of the surface of a cell is covered with proteins that have various functions that connect that cell to the outside, or the outside world. Next. And it's, sometimes it's hard to imagine how this could happen because we think of the surface of a cell sort of looking like the outside of a baseball or something smooth. But I just put in two of these cells here to show you that the actual lipid membrane on any cell is just much, much larger, much more surface area, like you can see here, than, than you ever imagined. There are like finger-like, you know, long spider-like extensions that can come from cells and lumps and bumps on cells. And this is just another picture showing you that if we have a signaling molecule comes in, so let's say this is um, a, a recognizing <clears throat> a protein on a, a bacteria, it binds to the receptor. What this doesn't show you is that the receptor changes shape. And when it changes shape, it binds a relay molecule. And that changes the shape of the relay molecule which allows it to interact with another molecule and which allows it to act with another molecule. And they go down and they turn on genes. Next, next slide. So often you'll see these microbes, the beneficial microbes that are recruited to the plant. They're referred to as plant growth promoting microbes. And these, this group of microbes, which is actually a very large group, okay, and are not the same around every single plant. Different plants in different soils recruit different populations. And the population that they can recruit is going to depend on what's there to begin with, as well as the actual texture and other conditions of your soil, okay. And they create a state of readiness to respond, and they actually provide nutrition to the plant and, and stimulate the growth of the plant. Next. And just so you know, you may recognize some of these names, Azo, Azetobacter, Pseudomonas, Rhizobium, Azospirillum, and Bacillus. Now, when we're looking at this, it looks like rhizobium would be like saying a cow. But actually, the genetic variation between one rhizobium and another is only 80%. You and I are 99, more than 99% similar to apes. Okay. 
So the difference between different rhizobium and there's gobs and gobs of them, okay, is like the difference between us and a cow. So why the reason these microbes have survived for four billion years, okay, when you know most species don't survive anywhere near even a million years is they are really so facile at picking up different DNA and changing. They not only pick up DNA and utilize it from members of the, their own species, they pick up DNA from different species. So they can respond extremely rapidly to many different kinds of, of stimuli and, and changes in the soil. Next. So the PGR, okay, they directly stimulate plant growth, okay? And plant growth is healthy plant. And we all know that one of the most important things for healthy immune system is a healthy individual. So they fix nitrogen for the plant. The rhizobia that are attached and also the rhizobia that exist freely in the soil. They solubilize phosphate. So there's lots of phosphate present in lots of soil. It's not detectable always chemically. So you could get a chemical test that says you don't have phosphate, but your microbes are able to release phosphate from minerals in the soil. They also make phytohormone productions, okay? Um, and these are hormones that they create that make the plant, stimulate the plant to grow. It's in the interest, since the plant is feeding the microbes, okay, not only when it's alive, but when it dies, it's in the interest of the microbes to have a healthy plant. And they make sidero pores, okay, which bring in minerals, and we'll talk about those. And indirectly, they uh, promote plant growth, okay, by immune mechanisms, such as they make lytic enzymes. That means enzymes that can lyse or break open uh, pathogens. Uh, they, we're all so familiar with the fact that they make antibiotics. They induce systemic resistance, as we said, and uh, they make exopolysaccharides, which we're not going to discuss. Next. One of the most important uh, microbes for plant growth are mycorrhizal fungi. And the mycorrhizal fungi, you know, we could definitely talk about for a whole session, okay? Are, are buscular mycorrhizal fungi, which actually penetrate the, leaf, the root of the plant, and ectorrhizal mycorrhizal which actually grow form a net like around the surface of the plant. And these mycorrhizal fungi colonize about 97, 90% of plants. And they are one of the big contributors to uh, increasing soil carbon and, um, and increasing soil structure uh, because of the substance they make glomalin, which allows them to stick to the soil. So, on this side of the plant, where my arrow is, I hope you can see it, we have no colonization by, uh, by, ecto, by, by mycorrhizal fungi. And the nutrients go in via root hairs, okay? And you see a phosphate depletion zone here. On this side, we've had our buscular mycorrhizal colonization, and it increases resistance to foliar pathogens. And it increases drought and salt tolerance tremendously. Okay. And you get increased innate uh, immunity. And it usually increases nutrient availability because all of these fungi put out really, really fine hairs, much finer than the root hairs. Okay. The hyphae. Of the, of the fungi 
can increase the surface area of the root up to a thousand fold. And they can get into much smaller areas than the root area can in terms of seeking out and bringing in the mineral nutrients that the plant wants and bringing in water. They bring in ammonia, they bring in all the minerals. Okay. We'll talk a little more about that later. Next. I just wanted to show you how a specific case in, of how a, the ectomycorrhizal fungi make the plant more resistant to salt and drought resistance. And that is on, on the top here, we have two root hairs, A and B. And these are, are two root hairs that have, have not had ectomycorrhizal fungi a colonization. And down here in C and D, you can see this halo around the outside. This halo, which is not specific, you know, we are, we, you can't see the individual hyphae here. You just see the halo on these kind of a gray. That's the fungi. And what the fungi has done is it stimulated the plant to increase the number of sugars in the root hair. And that increases the osmotic pressure. And under those conditions, the plant then brings in more water because there's higher osmotic pressure within the, within the cells of the large cells of the plant. And so the plant is able to get along with 50% of the water that's required without it. Now, I will say that this, you know, so I don't want everyone to just say, I'm going to go out and buy myself some ectomycorrhizal fungi because, you know, the fungi that are really best for you are the fungi that are adapted to your soil. And you want to remember whenever you're putting anything into your soil that you're bringing in a foreigner. Okay. And the reason your soil stays the way it is, stays itself all the time is it, it either the, 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 the microbes that you interject figure out how to get along with the microbiome that's in your soil right now, okay, or they adapt, you know, or they're killed off. So, you know, you're going to take experimentation in order to, you know, correctly use mycorrhizal fungi and I, I just want to point that out. Thanks. Next. And I just also like to point out at this particular point that the mycorrhizal fungi and the plant growth promoting bacteria, they're recruited to the rhizosphere by the plant. How does the plant re uh, recruit them? The plant puts out the types of foods that the bacteria or the fungi are looking for. So it enriches the uh, microbiome around the actual roots of the plant uh, to the type of, of microbe that it wants. Next. Okay, so I'd like to talk for a minute about siderophores. So what siderophores for are they're the method by which minerals are brought to the plant and to the microbes. So siderophore uh, benefits the microbe. It brings in the iron and, and magnesium, et cetera, that the microbe wants, as well as you know, doing this for the plant. So the microbe excretes this little blue net that you see here. And this little blue net is very, very good at picking up uh, minerals, okay? And it does that large part by, ch by charge, okay? So these have a positive charge. So th they're stuck in this net. And this net with the bound mineral, the shape of it is specifically recognized by a receptor, not shown. What is shown here is that once this goes inside the receptor, 
okay? The receptor kind of squeezes it, it changes its shape. So they interact, they squeeze, and they pop, you know, this mineral into the interior of the cell. So siderophores are required in order for the plant and the microbe to take up these minerals. So both of these need the same minerals. Next. Okay, so how is systemic resistance induced? Okay, by the plant growth bacteria, growth promoting bacteria or by the AMF, okay? This is trichoderm, which is a fungus. And it shows you in a, in a uh, enlarged picture down here that the fungus is, uh, is colonizing or interacting with the root hair. And that causes the root hair to secrete three acids, abyssinic, jasmatic, and salicylic acid. And when these go up, they increase the number of, of receptors on, on the cells in the plant. And that, that makes the plant resistant, in this case, to, um, to a, to a tomato uh, pathogen. Next. So if we're looking at all of the microbes that are in the, in the soil and how they're working to protect the soil, protect the plant, we have um, microbes that make quorum sensing molecules. I will discuss them. A quorum is how many people you need to um, take a vote on something. Siderophores, which we just talked about. Biocidal volatiles like cyanide. Well, we all know cyanide is a poison, so they can make poisons to poison their enemies or, or, or the plant's enemies. They make lytic enzymes, we'll talk about virulence factors and antibiotics. Next, please. I'm going to go over these. I love quorum sensing. Now, this is showing you that on this side, the right-hand side of the red barrier is the cell. And on this side is outside the cell and you have microbes. To, to explain this, what I'd like to do is talk about streptococcus because we're all familiar with streptococcal infection. And you all know that if you go to the doctor yourself or your children, the doctor takes a swab to see if you have a streptococcal infection. The fact is you always have streptococcus in your, in your throat, okay? But the test only detects it when you have a certain number of, of microbes, like this number over here, the big bad number over here. So they go along and the other microbes are usually keeping them in check, okay? What but this is putting out little, they call it pheromones, putting out little like, hormone-like molecules that says, I'm here. And here's a whole bunch of them. They're, they're multiplying and there's more of these molecules. And once you get a certain number of these molecules, it allows these, these uh, microbes, if with streptococcus in your throat, to make virulence factors. Until then, the virulence factors aren't turned on because it takes energy to make these virulence factors. And now you have put out virulence factors. And in this case, the virulence factor is one that allows the microbe to uh, make enzymes that allows it to enter and enter cells and use all the energy in the cell for multiplying itself even further. So next. So one of the protections that the microbes, the good plant growth promoting microbes do is they'll make an enzyme shown here in blue 
And this would be a, a quorum molecule showing you in orange. And this enzyme uh, binds it and it can just bind it up so that it can't interact with another microbe and turn on a virulence factor. So it can inactivate the quorum sensing molecules that are made by pathogens. And that's occurring all the time. Next. And if in fact, you know, the pathogen escapes, okay, and the virulence factors can, can interact with enzymes that bind, it binds, and then the enzymes can break them into two or three or four parts and inactivate them. So now you have non-virulent factors. So the plant is protected. So your, your, your good bacteria or your good microbes are, can inactivate virulence factors. Next. And they make enzymes like chitinase. So chitin is what protects the outside covering. It, it is the outside covering on fungi and it protects them. And if you break that open, the actual, the fungi will ooze out, will bleed out, so to speak, okay? And so you can kill it. There are lots of these different enzymes that the bacteria make. They, don't, they didn't make these specifically to help the plant, okay? They make these to also protect themselves. So, you know, they're all trying to get along, but they're also keeping protection for each other, from each other, to keep the whole thing in balance. You always have to have a little power to keep things, okay, next. I'm not gonna talk about the antibiotics and the antifungals, these are very important, okay? But we all, we've been taught about these since grammar school. So I'll, I'll leave that for now. Next. Um, so what I'd really like to emphasize at the end here is that the microbial community is part of the plant community and different plants are all connected by the microbial community. And actually plants that have been infected signal other plants, not just their own kind, but others, and induce immunity. And a lot of this comes through the fungal network. And this has been, well, you know, it, we're not gonna cover how it happens here, but it's well established and it's a very powerful, uh, Tool. And it's, it works really best if you don't have monocultures. So that's one of the big advantages of systems that have more than, you know, one type of plant in them. Next. And I like this little cartoon, which says, watch out, maphids are about, because one of the, some of the big studies that have been done is that one plant will, you know, the fungal network will actually turn on anti-aphid uh, reactions from one plant to another. And the, the plants make actually volatiles that's showing you here, the, vo the volatiles here that, uh, that, that, you know, are disliked by aphids. Next. Okay, so just to do one, talk about one specific response. And I guess I should just say before we start that this response is not as specific as our immune response, but it, it does work against the Pseudomonas syringae. So if you have this Pseudomonas syringae shown up here and it affects the, infects the the plant leaf. What the plant leaf does, it sends, it makes, it makes a chemical, okay, that is transmitted down to the roots. And it's transmitted, so now the root says, I know very specifically that this plant is affected by P. syringa. 
And the plant says, I know the response for that. It's malate secretion. It sends out malate because B subtilis FB17, that's candy. So B subtilis comes rushing in, okay? And it comes in and binds to the root, okay? As it's gobbling up the malate, okay? And it sends chemicals up to the leaf and actually the leaf and, and all the leaves of the plant, making the plant resistant to that particular pathogen. Um, and, and this response from the leaf, I mean, the leaf's response and recognition, the ability to recognize different pathogens is really amazing. One of the ones I found most interesting when I was studying is that the leaves can actually tell what type of caterpillar is, is eating them just by the vibration of the, of the chewing of that particular type of, of, of uh, caterpillar. And then they'll put out volatiles that bring in wasps that kill those, the, those specific uh, bacteria. Uh, I'm sorry. Next. So I'd like to say thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, we're very happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Fitzpatrick. Okay, now we have a, a few minutes for some Q&A. Um, one of the big questions in the chat room was, are we going to make a recording of this webinar available? And the answer to that is yes. We are going to be sending out a link via email to all attendees at this webinar. Um, okay, we have probably more questions than we'll have time to answer, uh, but Dr. Fitzpatrick uh, did uh, say earlier before this webinar began that they wanted to address everyone's questions and we're gonna be compiling those and sending them to her. Um, but first question, uh, I think is a good one because it really gets it sort of uh, the practicality of these really important concepts as you're explaining. And the question is, in field applications, what are some of the most effective methods to increase microbial health and induced immunity for crops? I, I think right now what we say is increase your microbial population so that you make sure you have a healthy microbial population. Now, the studies that are, that are done show that as you increase your microbial population, you will increase the uh, variation, the, the number of, of, of different types of microbes that you have. But I, I think those microbes are all there. They're just at too low a level to be detected before you have a, a healthy number of microbes. So you should have a microbial population of at least 300 in a, in a healthy soil and you know people who are who are raising strawberries, they'll have as many as 20,000 micrograms of microbial carbon per gram of soil. You know, it goes way, way up there buying these engineered soils so they can grow things in like 30 days or some very fast number. But, you know, I would say, you know, experiment in a pot and see, you know, what gives you the best boost. Are there some general principles that you recommend for increasing microbial life in your soil? I, I think that you should use our, we recommend using our test to do that, but it's, it's very specific. You know, we, we've taken different soils at different times people have, and they try different cover crops on them. And some cover crops will raise it 600%, some cover crops won't raise it at all. So you, you really have to experiment to see because you know, the, the increase in the microbes will actually tell you whether or not you're providing what's been growth limiting for your microbial population. And, the nutrients that are in your microbes are in your microbes, in your carbon, in your stored carbon, and in your plant in the same ratio. 
okay? Because they've been living together all this time, okay? So basically what you're seeing is you're increasing the nutrient level for your plant when you've increased the number of microbes that you have since a lot of the, you know, the plant relies on those microbes for, for getting its, the nutrients that it can't manufacture itself. Okay, um, another question. Can you speak to the potential for enhanced nutritional value via microbe associations, the plethora of plant and microbe metabolites that can promote human health upon ingestion beyond the 14 elements supplied in salt-based fertilizers? Um, well, I have, um, I have done some studies on this and I, I think this is you know, not something I can address in just one question. But um, it, it, it's very interesting because it turned out that like children who go to daycare centers don't have as many immune diseases and have a much healthier immune system, it appears. So do plants that are exp exposed to different microbes, including pathogens. So what you saw on this chart was that something becomes a pathogen. They don't actually always start out as pathogens. Like for strep, you always have strep in your throat. It only becomes a pathogen. So the, when the plant is stressed by being exposed to all these different things, it turns on the plant making all these antioxidants and these xanthines, et cetera. And these are um, often very specific to the uh, microbes that are in your soil as well as the type of soil you have. So they contribute a lot to the taste of the food. Um, you know, like, like wines get tastes and cannabis that's grown get specific tastes from the different soils and the different microbiomes that they're exposed to. And some of the uh, things in the seeds that contribute to that are actually uh, microbial uh, metabolites. So, but, but they stimulate, it's the antioxidant and 20,000 of these that are made by, by different plants that actually uh, are what results in the plant not needing pesticides. It, 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 it's, it's kind of ready all the time. And it's, sometimes it's a little smaller because of that because it has spent some energy going into uh, uh, building a hearty immune system. Great. Um, next question. Can you address fungal to bacteria ratio? I've heard some say that fungal dominance is most important. However, I've also read that this thought mostly holds true in perennial crops and longstanding orchards. I think that's a question that's really quite specific. I mean, the general rule is for agricultural crops, it should be about one to one. But you have to you have to remember that the fungal population is going to change with the time of year. So, you know, if you if your plan is going to be uh, colonized by AMF fungi then that's gonna happen early during the growth season in order for it to be helpful to the plant. So you're gonna see that occurring then. If you're looking for, and, and those fungi you will find close to the root, if not just right in the rhizosphere soil. So, you know, if I, if I take a dandelion and I look right at the rhizosphere soil, I can see sometimes way over 10 to one uh, fungal to bacterial because it's the ecto, you know, it's, it's the mycorrhizal fungi that I'm picking up. If, if I come to the time when I've just put down a lot of food in, in the, um, you know, green manure, so to speak, on the field, then what I'm gonna see is that I'm actually feeding the, the saprophytic fungi that break down this food for bacteria. So I'm gonna see 
you know, an increase in both the, the fungal and the bacteria that are breakdown foods. So at, at the end of the fall, you'll see an increase in the fungi in the fungi to bacterial ratio when the plant is taken up and there's just roughage left down there on, on the ground, for, which is full of cellulose that the fungi are, are good at breaking up. Um, Judith, could you um, talk a little bit about maybe the contrast between traditional soil testing and the work that you're doing? Okay, I think we've talked a little bit about that, Ben, and uh, you know, one of the things we found is that, especially people who are in the organic field, find that they can be told that the nutrient, that the chemical um, the, doesn't actually, the chemical tests don't actually reflect what's in the plant that they have. The soil chemical profile doesn't match what's in the plant and uh, doesn't match what's available like in the microbes. So the microbes can actually synthesize nitrogen. They don't do that if you provide nitrogen. The nitro, a, a lot, the chemicals, the chemical tests tell you what's chemically available. Most of the phosphorus that's in your soil is not chemically available. But the microbes, there's, there's, lots more phosphorus in most soil than you'll ever need. So the microbes are very capable of releasing that and of releasing the different uh, minerals that are in your soil. So, you know, the actual micro and, and the microbes need it almost in the same ratio as the plants. And so what the microbes are gonna tell you, if you have sufficient microbes there, they're gonna tell you like, I have enough minerals here. They, they, they give you a better indicator of soil health than any of that. And University of Tennessee used our study to show that, that microbiometer outperformed all of the soil health tests of any that they tried that, that could um, you know, measure soil health. Great. Okay, I think we are running up on time. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here today and submitting such insightful questions. Um, and I also want to thank Microbiometer for sponsoring this webinar. Um, again, a recording of this presentation will be sent to all registrants afterward. For more information on Microbiometer, visit microbiometer.com. That's M I C R O B I O M E. TER.com. Finally, I want to encourage you to visit acresusa.com to find out more about the work we're doing. Subscribe to our magazine, listen to our latest podcast, or perhaps buy the book that can help you take your farm operation to the next level. Uh, thanks again to Judith for joining us, and thanks to you, and we hope you have a great week.